Hello, everybody, and welcome back after lunchtime or nap time, whatever time this was for you. It was nap time for me, <laughs> but we're here for the second part of our program. My name is Rebecca King. I'm a board member of the Hypersomnia Foundation, and in that role, I have the pleasure of talking to many people who, like myself, are facing challenges living with idiopathic hypersomnia or narcolepsy. So living with hypersomnia impacts almost every aspect of your life. In fact, it often feels like the game of life where you're trying to manage a family and career and your own health while drawing cards that throw unexpected obstacles in your path. In the board game, you get through the obstacles on these cards by paying with fake money and waiting for your next turn. But in real life with hypersomnia, however, obstacles usually result in a loss of the quality of life and all too often real money. Let's look at some of the cards that present the greatest obstacles for people with hypersomnia. Our foundation has developed several resources which you can find on our website focused on providing information and tools to help address these challenges. All of these resources came about when real people with hypersomnia either asked us for more information or inspired us with their personal stories of overcoming obstacles. Most of these resources were developed by teams of people with hypersomnia and doctors working together. Today, I'd like to focus on situations that fall into four categories, special medical situations, problems accessing and affording medicines, having a procedure with anesthesia or being admitted to a hospital, and finding a new sleep doctor. In the board game of life, you just draw a card and choose a colored peg to have a child. In real life, it is not so simple. When someone with hypersomnia is thinking about becoming a parent, all sorts of questions and concerns come up. Many people with hypersomnia need to take hormone medicines. For those of us with hypersomnia, this is also a special medical situation because some hypersomnia medicines interact with hormone medicines. If you are facing either of these situations, go to our webpage at hypersomniafoundation.org and use the search bar to search on the words pregnancy, parenting, or hormone. If you search on pregnancy or parenting, you will find a web page full of information providing answers to some of the most common questions. Some of the content applies to all parents, even if they are not the one carrying the baby. A lot of people ask, will my child have hypersomnia if I do? What should we be doing to prepare for parenting? Can you adopt? What do I need to worry about in order to take care of the baby and the child safely? Other sections of the page are specific to the concerns of someone with hypersomnia who will be the one pregnant or nursing. Again, what do you do to prepare to get ready? Will my hypersomnia symptoms get better or worse when I'm pregnant? What do I need to do to take care of myself? And of course, there are always a lot of questions about medicines. Can I take the medicines when I'm trying to get pregnant, while I'm pregnant, while I'm nursing? I don't have enough time or space to be able to share with you the information and the answers to these questions, but the important point is for you to know that teams of experts and people who have had children who have heart sobriety have worked hard to put together the best possible information we have to answer these questions for you. The idea is that you can read it for yourself and also print it out or share it with the doctors that are helping you with this pregnancy so you can make the best possible decisions for you, your family, and your baby. If you search on our website with the word hormone, you will find detailed information on which hypersomnia medicines interact with hormone medicines, how they interact, and how to modify hormone treatment. Briefly, you need to know that modafinil and arbonafidil, shown here with their brand names Nuvigil and Provigil, plus pisholacent, shown here with the brand name Weightkicks, and clarithromycin may change the effectiveness of certain hormone therapies. 
This includes not just estrogen and progesterone, but also testosterone therapies. We constantly hear stories from people who had no idea that their hypersomnia medicine was interacting with their birth control, hormone replacement therapy for both men and women, and gender-affirming therapies. Our foundation worked with experts to build a web page that describes these interactions in detail and provides guidance to you and your doctor as to how to adjust hormone therapy dosage or birth control methods to account for the effects of the hypersomnia medicines. Once you've figured out which medicines to take, then the next thing that often happens is pulling the dreaded insurance cards. We actually surveyed our community on this topic a few years ago and found out that 40% of people with hypersomnia are currently not taking the medicine prescribed by their doctor due to insurance access and affordability issues. So let's break it down between the two cards. For those surveyed who do have insurance, 72% said they had faced an insurance denial during the previous two years. 30% say they have not filled a prescription because the out-of-pocket costs were too high. We didn't get enough survey responses from people who do not have insurance, but it's safe to assume that their situation is even more dire. The good news is that some people in our community have found ways to successfully appeal denials and have found programs to help pay for their hypersomnia medicines. We've collected their stories and advice and put it on our website for others to use when they are struggling with insurance and affordability. On our website, search on the term insurance or denials to find this information. The appealing denials section links to two important resources on how to appeal any type of insurance denial. The Patient Advocate Foundation, a nonprofit that assists people with all diagnoses, has written a guide to appeals using the traditional appeals process of an insurance company. They also have case managers that you can call and ask for assistance in preparing your appeal. We also have information about using a different approach to appeal. One of our community members, Alex, had lost her initial appeal using the traditional approach with an insurance company when she found a book titled, Approved, Win Your Appeal in Five Days. This book was written by Lori Todd, who calls herself the insurance warrior. The insurance warrior approach goes beyond the traditional and advocates for appealing directly to the leadership of the insurance company. Alex followed the instructions and won her appeal. We put both resources on the webpage so you can decide which one is best for your situation. Another important resource on the appeals webpage is a list of links to all of the peer-reviewed journal articles we can find that document the safety and efficacy of specific medicines in the treatment of hypersomnia. On the screen now is a subset of the much larger list. Why is this an important resource, you might ask? For off-label prescriptions, insurance companies may require the doctor list two peer-reviewed journal articles that demonstrate that the medicine being prescribed has been shown to be safe and effective for the off-label diagnosis. My doctor had to submit an appeal of this type for me in 2017, and I know that one member of the doctor's staff spent hours trying to find two doc articles supporting methylphenidate for the treatment of IH. I thought at the time, I wonder how many hours are wasted every year by doctors and staff members trying to find these articles for appeals. What if someone made a list of all the articles so that doctors could save all of that time? And now the list exists. Please tell your doctors about it and use it yourself for your own appeals. For those appeals where it will take more than two peer-reviewed journal articles, we have three sample appeal letters on the website. The first one was written by a doctor appealing on behalf of her patient. This letter is about four and a half pages long, and it is very good at succinctly laying out the key arguments why a medicine approved for narcolepsy should be covered for a patient with IH. This letter could be the basis for an appeal by your doctor or, modified slightly, be rewritten as an appeal by a patient. The second appeal is the one written by Alex, the person I mentioned earlier who found the book approved when your insurance in five days. She gave us her appeal to post on our webpage, and I have to warn you, it is quite long. 
But when we share this appeal with Lori Todd, the author of the book on winning appeals, she said that even if you had about 10% of the content of this appeal, you'd have a strong likelihood of winning. So the third appeal is similar to Alex's, as it was written by someone who was modifying Alex's appeal to her own situation. We decided to post both long appeals on the website, not because we think it's necessary for your appeal to be this long, but to enable you to easily copy the sections that work for you into your own appeal. We would really love to have more appeal letters, especially since the three that we have are all for the same medicine, Xyrum. If you do successfully appeal and would like others to benefit from your hard work, please consider sending the Hypersomnia Foundation a de-identified copy for us to post on the website. If your out-of-pocket costs are too high and you are facing having to give up your medicines, my first recommendation is to see if the manufacturer of the medicine has a patient assistance program. Manufacturer-sponsored patient assistance program exists to help people access and afford medicines offered by that manufacturer. Some companies provide a lot of assistance and some provide very little. It is solely up to the company to determine how much assistance they provide and the eligibility requirements. I wish I could tell you exactly how they work, but that information is proprietary. Our Saving Money on Prescription Medicines webpage includes this table of manufacturer patient assistance programs and their contact information. So I strongly encourage you to pick up the phone and Call these programs every time you are unable to afford your medicines. I have met people who applied and were denied one year, then their situation changed and they applied and were approved. Not only can your situation change, it's also true that the policies for these programs can change, so just keep trying. If the manufacturer program is unable to help, then there are three more options that I am aware of. First is the National Organization for Rare Disorders, commonly called NORD, which runs a co-pay assistance program. In addition to this program, the NORD website has lots of information to help patients and families living with rare disease. The Patient Advocate Foundation is the nonprofit I mentioned earlier that has been helping people afford medicines and healthcare for 25 years. Their website is full of information and if you need further help, you can call and ask for a case manager who will personally review your situation and offer suggestions and support. Needy Meds is another nonprofit dedicated to helping people afford the medicines they need. In addition to coupon programs, they have a website and a call line to help people find the programs they need to be able to afford their medicine. There's more information about insurance and cost savings than I can cover today, so be sure to check out the website so for now, let's go back to the game board and see what comes up in the next set of cards. When someone with hypersomnia needs a procedure with anesthesia or is admitted to the hospital, there are often very real concerns, such as difficulty waking up from anesthesia, loss of access to hypersomnia medicines, and interactions with sedating medicines, such as opioids and anesthesia. Nowadays, it's common to meet your anesthesiologist mere minutes before the procedure is scheduled to begin, and we hear many stories of people trying to explain hypersomnia to a blindsided anesthesiologist or surgeon who have very little time to adjust. We also know of times when hypersomnia medicines are taken away or someone is not allowed to maintain their sleep schedule in the hospital, causing the person with hypersomnia to become extremely sleepy confused and distressed. It really gets tough in emergencies when medical professionals have no idea what hypersomnia is and frantic family members are trying to explain. Here are some of the scenarios we hear about often in our community. People with hypersomnias may react differently to opioids or anesthesia. Surgeons may not understand the need to schedule surgeries for later in the day when we can wake up and get to the hospital. Hospital staff may not recognize the symptoms of hypersomnia and may think you are having a bad reaction to a treatment or are being belligerent and uncooperative. If you bring hypersomnia medicines from home, they can be dispensed incorrectly or taken away entirely. In some cases, our experiences are stories of accidents or emergencies where nobody on the medical team was aware of the hypersomnia. 
In order to avoid these scenarios, the Hypersomnia Foundation teamed up with anesthesiologists and sleep doctors to develop resources to encourage advanced planning prior to surgery, hospitalization, or emergencies. On our website, search for anesthesia or hospitalization and you'll find a web page which begins with a guide for patients to download and share with their care team. This guide outlines the most common anesthesia and hospital care issues and is designed to promote discussion of the most relevant topics. The results of the discussion should be a care plan, which is filled out in advance of any planned procedure or hospitalization and shared with the care team. A great idea is to post a printed copy of the guide and the care plan on the patient's hospital bed rail or bulletin board. If you want to be prepared in case of an accident or emergency, you can work with your sleep doctor to create an emergency care plan. The tricky part is having the plan available when you need it, especially if you are the one incapacitated and can't speak for yourself. Emergency medical professionals are most likely to look in three places for information about you. A medical alert in your phone, wearable medical alerts like a bracelet or necklace, or a medical alert card in your wallet. If you put the guide, your care plan, and any other important medical information in a secure folder on the cloud, and then the, put the URL to that folder in your medical alert, you will have the best chance that the medical professionals will find this information when it is needed. Yes, I know it takes time and effort to set all of this up. But if you are concerned about getting the best possible care in an emergency, go to hypersomniafoundation.org and search on the word emergency or alert for detailed instructions and a free downloadable medical alert card form. The last category we'll talk about today is finding doctors. People with hypersomnia are always finding themselves in situations where they need to find a new sleep doctor. I've personally pulled two of the three cards on this slide, and I've only had my diagnosis for five years. The Hypersomnia Foundation would like to direct people in our community to doctors who know about our disorder and who are experienced and comfortable with helping people find the treatments that give them the best possible quality of life. But we need your help to do so. We do have a directory on our website with 120 doctors and nurse practitioners from around the world who care for people with hypersomnias. But that isn't nearly enough, and there are numerous cities and rural areas with no provider in the directory. I looked in our directory for providers in Utah and found only one. If you are someone who has an excellent sleep doctor, but they are not already in our directory, please uh, do your community a big favor and ask that doctor to join. All they have to do is go to hypersomniafoundation.org, search for join directory, and take five minutes to fill out the form. I know we've only been able to touch very briefly on several big topics today. We could probably talk for hours about each and every one of them. But the most important thing to know is that these resources exist, thanks to the many members of our community who have contributed their knowledge and experiences for us to share with others. If anyone out there has another great idea or experience that they know would benefit others, we very much want to hear from you. We are particularly interested in successful insurance appeal letters that we can uh, post to make it easier for others to prepare their own appeals. The best way for us to reach us is to email your story to info at hypersomniafoundation.org. And now let's see if there are any questions. Thank you, Rebecca. Any questions? I saw the um, patient alert card. Is that something we can fill in online or do we have to print it out and write it only? I'm not sure the answer to that question. I know it's a PDF. I think it is fillable and you can type it in and then print and fold it up, um, but I'm not 100% sure. Okay, thank you. Andrew. Um, in the uh, process of writing these appeal letters to insurance companies, um, do you recommend also seeking assistance from the manufacturers 
Um, do, do, do they have resources that, that can be particularly useful? And do we have contacts, perhaps, at least at our sponsors, that, that, that may help with that? So there, I did have a slide on the, the patient assistance programs for the manufacturers. Those programs are not to help you make an appeal to insurance company. So it's almost a separate thing. If you appeal and, or if you actually, even if you have coverage for insurance, but the out-of-pocket costs are still too high, you can call the patient assistance programs and ask for help on those out-of-pocket costs. But all the way around, if you're getting a denial and it's, you, you can't get past it, it helps to call the patient assistance programs and see if they have some sort of program that can help you or a bridge program sometimes they will have that will help cover your medicines while you are trying to go through your appeal. Does that, make, does that answer your question? It does, okay. Yes. Anyone else? Okay. Okay, Rebecca, thank you so much.